You are listening to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast, episode 040. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast. I am Joe Chaffin, your host. I have got a great interview to share with you today on, on a topic that actually might first seem old school to some of you and might be brand new to others of you. And we'll get to that in a second. But Dr. Mark Yezer is back to talk about whole blood in an episode I like to call Holy Whole Blood. Yeah, you could put a Batman on there on the end. But anyway, <laughs> so one thing I need to share with you before we get started with this episode is many of you are aware with the last episode, episode 039, we started uh, awarding free category one continuing medical education for physicians. Uh, and that it was very well received. I'm really grateful for those of you that signed up uh, and and went ahead and did that. Now, however, for this episode, we actually have PACE contact hours from the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science available. Again, it's free. You can get one up to one contact hour per month, uh, either from CME or or from uh, from Pace, so so fantastic news! I'm so excited about it. Uh, it's this is offered through TransfusionNews.com and Wiley Publishing, with uh, generous sponsorship from BioRad, who has no editorial control over the process at all. So here's how it works. So you listen to the episode just like you usually do, um, either at for this episode bbguy.org slash zero four zero or iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts through iTunes. Uh, on your phone, whatever, Google Play, wherever you listen to the podcast, um, th- there's a transcript and sometimes a quiz available to enhance learning that are th- that's available on the show page at, again, bbguy.org slash 040. On the page, you can follow the link to the Transfusion News Continuing Education page, which is on the Wiley Health Learning site. If you want to go there directly, that's fine, too. The address is wileyhealthlearning.com. That's W-I-L-E-Y healthlearning.com slash Transfusion News. No problem. Uh, there you'll complete the steps, which are really self-explanatory. You have to do a free registration. Uh, you'll do a quiz. You'll do an evaluation at the end. And during that evaluation, you'll have to choose either to get uh, continuing medical education if you're a doc or pace cre- c- contact hours if you're a laboratorian uh, you do all that finish the quiz all that you you get your certificate and again it's completely and totally free i am so happy and so excited about this i know s- the, many of you are are as well so here's the legalese for this we have to make sure that we that we do this properly so that everybody gets credit and here we go funding for this activity was provided by biorad who has no editorial control over the content of the episode me donald joe Chaffin, and MD. I disclose no relevant financial relationships, while Dr. Mark Yezer discloses honoraria from Terumo. This activity underwent peer review in line with the standards of editorial integrity and publication ethics maintained by Transfusion News under the direction, excuse me, under the direction of Editor-in-Chief Aaron Tobin, MD, PhD. Dr. Tobin discloses honoraria from Quotient Biodiagnostics and Orthoclinical Diagnostics for his role as speaker and honoraria from Griffles for his role as a consultant. The peer reviewers, however, disclose no relevant financial relationships. John Wiley & Sons is accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education to provide continuing medical education for physicians. John Wiley & Sons Incorporated designates this enduring material for a maximum of one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Physicians should only claim credit commensurate with the extent of their participation in the activity. I like the word commensurate. John Wiley & Sons is also approved as a provider of continuing education programs in the clinical laboratory sciences by the ASCLS PACE program. And there is the total number of contacts available uh, is one hour. To receive credit for this activity, visit www.wileyhealthlearning.com slash transfusion news. Okay, on to today's topic. Mark Yezer was my very first guest on the, the podcast a long time ago, last year, <laughs> and I'm so honored to have him back for episode 40. Mark is a medical director with, with the Institute for Transfusion Medicine in Pittsburgh and a professor of pathology at the University of Pittsburgh. And he's here today to tell us why he believes, in his words, low titer, cold stored, group O whole blood is the ideal pre and early in hospital resuscitation fluid. So whole blood use has declined dramatically over the decades, but Mark believes it's time for whole blood to make a comeback, and he's about to tell us why. 
By the way, you should stay tuned at the end at the end because I have an update. And there's it's, since there's been an important change by ABB since Mark and I had this com- this conversation that you're about to hear, which was in late August. So here is my interview with Dr. Mark Yazer on whole blood. Well, hey, Mark, welcome back to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast, my man. Hey, Joe, it's great to be back. I see you, uh, you know, after after I kicked it off for you, you had a whole bunch of other really high quality podcasts that come, but surely you always remember your first, right? Well, you know, I, my question for you is, you know, how have you handled all the fame that has come as a result of being, you know, the first guest on the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast? How's that been for you? I've had to get a really long stick <laughs> to keep them all away. Yep, it's it's been tough. You know, we considered some witness protection, uh, but uh, but it's you know I'm learning to deal with it. It's it's not okay. so easy. I totally understand. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, Mark, you, you and I have uh, you and I have obviously spoke. Uh, we spoke last year about uh, the use of whole blood derived platelets. And just from that conversation and just from the many, many times that I've heard you speak over the years and our, our email communications, I know that you, you a little bit revel in the whole, um, I don't want to say that you're a contrarian because I don't think you are, but you, you like to take a look at things and say, why have we always done it this way or why are we currently doing it this way? Why don't we consider other stuff? Is that a fair way to put how you, how you look at, uh, at kind of established quote unquote dogmas in transfusion medicine? Yeah, I think that's part of the fun of transfusion is that now we're finally, you know, in a position where we can ask these questions. You know, I mean, it, it was only recently, Joe, that we, we figured out what red cell transfusion thresholds should be for, mm-hmm. for patients who are getting hip surgeries, sepsis, uh, cardiac surgeries. You know, you'd think that we, we would have had this sorted out years ago. But yeah. um, transfusion is really undergoing a renaissance of investigation and and really good studies. And so now is a great time to be asking questions yeah. about, about our practice. I, I completely agree. And, and this topic that we're going to talk about today is, it, I think, really fits into that really nicely. So let's set it up a little bit. I, 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 want, to, I want to take you through a little bit on, on your, your feelings on this topic, which is, yeah, I, and I'll just, I'll just read flat out that what you sent me as your, your basic tenet for this, for this discussion. That is, and I'm quoting you, whole blood is the ideal pre and early in hospital resuscitation fluid. So we're going to get into those details, but we're, we're primarily talking about this today in terms of, in terms of trauma resuscitation. And I've had quite a, quite a bit of discuss, quite a number of discussions recently on trauma resuscitation, had a, uh, an emergency medicine critical care doc on not too long ago, talking through the logistics from the, from the trauma side. We've talked, I've talked about massive transfusion. But I, I'm curious about how you feel um, about just kind of how you read the trauma resuscitation literature right now. What, all the stuff that's out there, including obviously the proper study that came out not too long ago. How do you feel about where we are and, and how things are looking? Again, a real renaissance of, of studies and, and of new knowledge that, that's um, been brought to light by these studies. You know, I think one of the most important things that we've learned um, in the in the resuscitation literature is just how multifactorial the coagulopathy of trauma is, mm-hmm. uh, and how many patients are are subject to it when they first arrive in the helicopter or when they uh, come to the door of the emergency department. You know, depending on the studies you read, you can find upwards of 40% of patients are or have some degree of coagulopathy of, of derangement of their clotting factors when they hit the door. And so probably a bad pun in a talk about trauma, right? But mm-hmm. um, uh, in, a, in, 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 in a very real sense, we need to understand quickly who those patients are. But mm-hmm. even with our fastest tests that, that we can do uh, near patient or at the point of care, um, we don't know exactly if this patient is that patient with the coagulopathy or is not. And right. so I think that, 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 that what we've learned and what's really important is the idea of providing plasma early in the resuscitation. And that's mm-hmm. not to say that we need to be providing the same quantity of plasma through the entire resuscitation or that patients should be resuscitated with a, with a certain recipe or fixed ratio for mm-hmm. the entire time. Um, but I, I, I think that, the, that it would be difficult to dispute the need for the early intervention with plasma. Um, and I think whole blood is, is a great way to provide red cells, platelets, and plasma in one, in one product. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I, I mean, how, how about – so I, I – I have to ask this because I think it's really important, and, and I, I fear 
I don't know. The, the, this may not be the right way to put it, but but since Proper came out, I have had people mo- more on the trauma resuscitation side, uh, the clinical side, than on the, the blood bank side that have said, well, that answers the question. It's done. There's no need to study it anymore. And I'm not totally sure that it is done. I'm, and I'm not sure that we'll be able to do another big study like that, but I'm not sure that that completely answered the questions. And this is a little bit of a sidebar, I realize, from what we're talking about today. But can I, can I ask for your, your feeling on that? Well, I tell you what, Joe, had I won that Powerball lottery last week, <laughs> you know, with the three quarters of a billion dollars, yes. I would have funded um, another version of the proper study and mm-hmm. probably called it something a bit more fun like uh, – Something to do with my Montreal Canadiens or Ipswich Town or <laughs> yes. Flensburg, uh, you know, something more interesting. But but what I would have done a little differently is I would have had a, a, a fixed ratio arm. So pick your ratio, mm-hmm. one to one to one plasma red cell platelet, one to one to two. Pick, pick, pick your fixed ratio. And then I would have had a different arm, which would have been anything other than a fixed ratio. Mm-hmm. So it would have been surgeon's intuition. It would mm-hmm. have been TEG. Uh, guided or, or, or other um, point of care or near patient care tested guided arm, something that isn't a fixed ratio so, so that we can actually ask the question, what is the ideal way to resuscitate the patients? To my mind, the proper study evaluated two very similar ratios mm-hmm. and the primary outcome, not surprisingly, was not significantly different between right. the two. And there were some differences in secondary outcomes. Uh, there was less bleeding, uh, death from bleeding in, in the higher ratio. Uh, and, and some other secondary outcomes were, were, were more favorable in the high ratio group, but those are secondary outcomes. Those generate mm-hmm. hypotheses. They don't prove them. So to my mind, I don't think proper has, has answered the question of what is the ideal way of resuscitating patients. I think it might have asked the, or, or, or at least uh, solved the question of if you want to do a ratio, what is the ratio that mm-hmm. you should use? But I'm not a believer that the ratio should be started on every patient from the moment they walk in to the minute the bleeding stops. I think a, I think a ratio is a good way to, to think about uh, transfusing blood products to patients early in the resuscitation mm-hmm. because they're going to need platelets, they're going to need plasma, but then we need to get uh, some testing. We need to understand what, what what's wrong with the patient, what where is their defect, and sure. then begin to provide personalized medicine uh, by by correcting the defect that 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 the testing tells us that they have. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well. So, so as we get into your, our topic for today, which is, again, I'll just uh, say what you said. Whole blood is the ideal pre and early in hospital resuscitation fluid. I think that since so many people that are, that are listening to my podcast are, are learners, they're, I mean, we're all learners, right? But people that are early in their careers in the field, as well as people that aren't necessarily totally fluent in blood bank terminology. So, so let's, let's just talk the basics. You can walk into most transfusion services in the United States, certainly not all, but you can walk into most and you'll see red cells, you'll see platelets, you'll see various forms of, of frozen plasma. In most places, you won't see something that's labeled whole blood. So what do we mean when we talk about whole blood? What Are there different varieties? What's the deal? Do you know, it's, um, it, it's, it is what the name says it is. It's, it's everything that comes out of the donor's arm plus a little bit of um, anticoagulant and preservative solution. Mm-hmm. So it's basically what the red cells, platelets, and plasma was before it got manufactured into the red cells, platelets, and plasma. So mm-hmm. it comes out of the donor's arm. Mm-hmm. It comes out in a physiologic concentration, um, and and we, we put it into a little bit of, of – CPD solution, although it can be put into other things, mm-hmm. and we store it for uh, for up to 21 days in CPD, of course. Okay, okay. And and are there are there differences in in different versions of whole blood and in, in how long they're stored and how quickly they're used? Sure. You know, I mean, I I think people who've seen um, recent and 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 historical war movies might be idea sure. might be familiar with the idea of what's called a buddy transfusion, and so. Uh-huh. This is, you know, a very far forward mission where um, uh, medevac is going to be hours away. And so the the medics, in fact, the rangers will carry with them um, a transfusion kit. So if someone unfortunately gets injured and needs a transfusion, they'll draw uh, a, a unit of blood from, uh, from somebody who isn't injured, who's ABO compatible, mm-hmm. and they'll give the transfusion right away. So that blood is warm. It's almost as, it's as close as you can get to a vein to vein transfusion. Right. It's warm. It's fresh. Mm-hmm. It hasn't been stored for any more than minutes before it gets infused into the injured um, soldier. 
Um, and that's that's whole blood. That's that's warm, fresh whole blood. Now, it's not tested before it's uh, transfused. The soldiers undergo testing before they're deployed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the FDA won't allow us to go to that length um, in the civilian uh, world, but they will allow us to transfuse whole blood um, that's been tested and shown to be free from all the usual um, parasites and viruses. Mm -hmm. um, and we store this in the refrigerator. Uh, um, and if it's stored in CPD, then uh, it's good for up to 21 days. It does not have to be agitated. Um, and um, yeah, and it's and it's okay. never frozen plasma too, so so it hasn't undergone a frozen a freeze thaw cycle. Okay, so uh, one last question in terms of you, you mentioned some of the regulatory stuff. One last question before we start hitting uh, the advantages that you see for whole blood. Are we limited at all in terms of perhaps uh, standards from ABB or other regulatory organizations in terms of who we can give or how we? assess compatibility for whole blood products? Well, uh, Joe, as a matter of fact, we are. Um, the current uh, version of the AABB standards require whole blood to be given in an ABO identical manner. So it means that a group A recipient has to get a group A unit of whole blood. Mm -hmm. in, in that case, obviously, the red cells and the plasma would be fully compatible with with that recipient. It, it is technically... Uh, you're not supposed to give, let's say, a group O whole blood unit to anybody who isn't group O mm -hmm. um, because th the uh, standards don't permit the transfusion of minor incompatible plasma. That means plasma that could have some anti-A or anti-B in it that will bind to the recipient's red cells and potentially cause some hemolysis. Of course, we do that anyway with platelets <laughs> and with uh, some group A plasma right. that might or might not be low titered. But at the moment, uh, the, the whole blood is meant to be given in an ABO uh, identical manner. Um, you know, you, Phil Spinella and I, on behalf of the AABB and Thor Working Party, are working with the AABB to try and get them to change the standard. Mm -hmm. We've submitted some um, comments on the, on the 31st edition of the standards, and mm -hmm. we'll see what happens. Yeah. We, we'd, like to, we'd like to be able to use low titer, cold stored group O whole blood in an uncross-matched way without worrying about the recipient's ABO group so that we can give it to them early when they're still in the field or when they first come into the, the hospital. And, and that gets us to, to what we're going to talk about today. So, so you, you have been involved in, uh, in several, several papers that, that discuss the use of whole blood um, in this setting for res hemostatic resuscitation of major bleeding. For example, a paper that you, that you did with Phil Spinella in uh, Transfusion of April of 2016 and a more recent one um, that was in Transfusion Medicine, I believe, also, right? In 2016 also? Um, That's right. Okay, so bo both of the, everyone, I will put the references for both of those papers on the show page, so you can you I would and I would highly recommend that you take a look. But Mark, let's talk first about your first perceived advantage for the use of whole blood. If it is the perfect, quote unquote, or the ideal pre and er, pre and early hospital uh, resuscit resuscitation fluid. Advantage number one you mentioned is the long history that we have of doing this. And you kind of alluded to that a little bit a minute ago, but why don't you take us through a little bit? Where have we been with whole blood? Well, whole blood's been with us through um, through almost every uh, battle that we fought in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about it, if you go back to the earliest transfusions, um, Jean-Baptiste Denis was transfusing whole blood from sheep into people because, you know, the calm spirit of the sheep is going to calm the wild, crazy uh, person down. It's going to get rid of the fever, you know, and, and nothing could go wrong, right? What no. could go wrong? No. <laughs> when you give a sheep blood to, to, I mean, we eat sheep, right? So why can't we have a transfusion with their blood? Logical, and it makes a lot of sense, right. uh, except it doesn't, of course. Uh, right. <laughs> so that was a whole blood transfusion, if you want to go back that far. Mm -hmm. um, but if you sort of come to the more modern reasonable uh, approach to, to whole blood. Um, you know, one of the first uh, whole blood transfusions was during the Great War, where 20 soldiers were transfused with it and nine of them survived. And, mm -hmm. and that's great news, whether it was because of the whole blood or the um, penicillin they were getting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's unclear, but, but at least, uh, at least it, it provided some, some very positive momentum, uh, which the U.S. Army built upon greatly during the Vietnam and Korea Wars. And they were transfusing literally hundreds of thousands of units mm -hmm. of low titer uh, whole blood to to their soldiers and, and let's face it it's easier right it's easy right. to get a unit of whole blood and just keep it rather than have to have a centrifuge and spin it yeah. and then worry about how are you going to get you know press the plasma off 
you know, they were they they were being very pragmatic and they were using whole blood uh, and transfusing it um, in 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 enormous quantities, uh, with really only a few reports of, of hemolytic events. One sort of very famous um, hemolytic event occurred because. Um, I think it was a group O recipient got a group A unit of whole blood. Mm -hmm. So that was a clerical error, right? That should never right. have happened, and, mm -hmm. and, and the person hemolyzed. But that's not an intrinsic you know, property of, sure. uh, of whole blood. That was just basically a screw-up. And so can I say that on the on You the can. Internet? You I can say screw-up. Absolutely. You can say it four times if you want, so that's fine. <laughs> all right, I'll come back to it then. <laughs> okay. Well, Mark, I guess let this me, is the Internet after all. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> let me interrupt you for just one second because you, you used a term there that I want to make sure that, that the, the learners listening to this podcast understand. You said specifically low titer. Uh, group O whole blood. So, it, it, again, sidebar real quickly for us. What do you mean when you say low titer? Right. Thanks, Joe. So, so the problem with whole blood, or 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 well, the the main drawback to using whole blood is that group O whole blood, which is the group of whole blood that we're going to use when we don't know what the recipient's type is, because mm -hmm. we can give group O red cells to anybody. It's right. a universal red cell donor, and the same is kind of true for whole blood. So, a group O unit of whole blood is going to be, the, the red cell part of it will be compatible with everybody. No right. one has antibodies against group O, well, except the Bombay people, but right. that's different. So, <laughs> so group O is the universal donor. The problem with group O whole blood is that it's got some anti-A and anti-B in the plasma part. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not group O, you know, if you're group A, B, or AB, then necessarily you're going to be getting some incompatible plasma with that group O whole blood. And so by low titer, what I mean is, We've, the, what I mean is that we check the unit and we make sure that the titer or the concentration or the level of anti-A or anti-B is low. Okay. And you, you, you want to know what low means, and I want to know what it means too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There, there is no standard definition of, of low titer. Right. Um, you know, just to, just to, 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 be a, uh, to give a spoiler here, in Pittsburgh, we use a titer of less than 50. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so the, the, the titer of anti-A and anti-B, the concentration is less than 50, but I know at other civilian hospitals, they use titers of less than 200. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's perfectly fair. I think anything less than 200, uh, should count as a low titer and the risk of hemolysis is going to be very low. Okay. The way you would pick the titer would depend on your population. You know, we, we use 50 and we end up excluding about 20% of our donors based mm -hmm. on that. I think if you use a higher titer, you would exclude fewer donors, and we and we can live with excluding twenty percent. That that's fine for us. Okay, and you you mentioned that that in the the wars in U.S. military experience that there were hundreds of thousands of those units that were used. Did, did the military and I actually I don't know the answer to this question, even though I was in the military. Do you, was there a, a did they use a standard that was different from anyone else, or do we know what the what titer they defined as low titer? Yes, I think they use less than 256 oh, as okay. a titer. So um, much higher than what you're currently using. Yes, it's it's five times higher than what mm -hmm. we're using in Pittsburgh. And, 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 and I think that, like I say, anything that's a reasonable titer, um, uh, 256, 200, I, I think all of that is less than all of that is is perfectly fine. Okay. So, so we've we've talked a little and, bit. And, and you know what, Joe? We're we're we're, we're going to find out, right? I mean, if it turns yeah. out that two fifty six really is a bit too high, then fine, we'll dial it back. Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, and and I think that's part of the the learning process that's that we're going to get with whole blood in this very uh, controlled uh, and very um, uh, academic uh, experience that we're going to get with it. Okay. Well, and I mentioned that I was in the military, and I, I will tell you that before we finish the, the history part, um, I, and I know you know this, let's make sure that our audience does, uh, the, the, use of, the use of whole blood did not stop in the military <laughs> but with the end of, with the, end of the, the wars. We've, we've certainly seen a, a, a resurgence in Iraq and Afghanistan. What's your pr perspective on that? Yes, indeed. There's been um, uh, it hasn't stopped, and again, it's been a very pragmatic approach, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to store stuff that's frozen because it takes a freezer, which takes a yeah. constant electricity, and it takes a lot of power. And so, if you have a walking blood bank, if you have uh, blood stored in the donor until you need it, that's that's great. Again, it's a very pragmatic approach to providing um, life-saving therapy. In the civilian world, it's a little different because we're expected to have ongoing power. We're expected right. to be able to test our, our units before we uh, transfuse them. And so mm -hmm. we're held to a different standard um, because we're not as we're not in an auster as austere an environment as as they are overseas. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, I I, th I think we sh I so we've we've established clearly that there's a, a really long and strong history of of using whole blood. Are are you ready to move on to your second advantage, or is there anything else you wanted to to bring up about historical stuff, Mark? No, I think that's great. I think uh, I think we have a long history of it, and mm -hmm. uh, and I think that bodes as bodes well for us using this okay. uh, going forward. Okay, so your your second perceived advantage of, of whole blood as, as this ideal resuscitation fluid is that it simplifies the logistics of the resuscitation. What do you mean by that? I'd like to question you on the word perceived. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm trying to be open-minded here, buddy. Give me a break. Okay, yeah, well, that, at least that wasn't meant to be pejorative. Be... I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you talked earlier about the trauma surgeon you had on, and they were talking about the logistics of the resuscitation, yes. right? And, and, and I think, you know, for, for, the, for the trainees who haven't seen a trauma patient or, or who haven't seen a massively bleeding patient who's getting blood products, if you get a chance to go to the emergency and see it, it's, it's scary. Mm -hmm. It's scary to see all those people running in and out, all those fluids that are being hung. Uh, uh, I, I think anything that we in the transfusion community can do to help make that easier uh, is going to be a big benefit to our clinical colleagues. And I know that giving them one bag instead of three bags is an advantage. Yeah. You know, uh, um, platelets cannot be run through a rapid infuser. There's, a, there's this idea that platelets get activated. They become less useful if you put them through a rapid infuser, which is a device that can transfuse liters and liters of blood very quickly. Right. And so what you have is platelets, uh, pardon me, red cells and plasma going into the rapid infuser. That's being infused in one line. Mm -hmm. And then the platelets are going in in a different line. And that's in the trauma bay, right? I mean, imagine when you get in, in the field and, and you're in the helicopter and mm -hmm. the helicopter's got monitors and beds and people and intubation equipment. Do you have room for three bags? Yeah. Well, I guess you do. But wouldn't it be better <laughs> if you could have only one bag yeah. and transfuse that one bag, which is the same size uh, as a red cell unit that we know how to transport and we know mm -hmm. how to store? Uh, and and, and the patients will get the plasma up front, which is, which is what many of them need early in their resuscitation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the biggest advantage um, that we know of at the moment of, of whole blood is that it makes the trauma surgeon's lives so much easier. Yeah. Well, do we have do we have any data, Mark? Let's let's put the rubber to the road here. Do we have any data to suggest that that doing it this way um, gets gets people that quote unquote balanced resuscitation more rapidly than doing it with individual with individual products, the so-called one to one to one? This is this is an evolving literature, you know, mm -hmm. the use of the of whole blood in the civilian setting. It's really new, right? Mm -hmm. It really is a new thing. Um, uh, there's some centers in, in, in USA doing it. Norway is doing it. Um, mm -hmm. So this is this is kind of the Achilles heel in my argument about oh. the greatness of whole blood is, <laughs> is, is, is the outcomes data, which you've just exploded uh, <laughs> right up front. <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. We, we don't we don't have a lot of information to, to say that yes the whole blood resuscitation with whole blood is better but it's coming and I can tell mm -hmm. you that that's some preliminary preliminary data that we have from our pediatric hospital uh, in Pittsburgh where we're doing uh, whole blood for injured um, uh, pediatric patients we showed a, a very statistically significant reduction in the amount of time it takes to get one unit of plasma platelets and red cells when the patient is getting whole blood compared to when they're getting component therapy, uh, right? It can, in often, it can, it was often hundreds of minutes faster mm -hmm. to give the patient everything in the whole blood than for somebody to think, okay, well, we're going to give the platelets, uh, we're going to give the plasma, now we're going to give some red cells, because all of that's in the emergency fridge. Yeah. You've got to think about ordering the platelets. Uh, you've got to actually order the platelets if you're not ordering an MTP, massive transfusion protocol, mm -hmm. and then you've got to give it. And so, mm -hmm. and so, Upfront, early on, when the patient is coagulopathic and, and needs these products, they all get in faster with whole blood than with components. Got it. And that's really, I, I wasn't trying to explode your, your outcomes data yet, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I was more getting to the, what you were saying about it. You've, you've shown, at least preliminarily, that, that you, you're get, you get that whole blood in faster than, than perhaps you might if you're trying to just kind of uh, 
pick and choose the others and, and get them all in. So I, 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 I hear totally what you're saying. And we'll come to the outcome stuff, and then we'll have a big fight. No, I'm kidding. We won't have a big fight. <laughs> but but let's, let's, talk about, uh, let's talk about something that I think is really important. I won't even say that this is a perceived advantage, Mark. I think this is a clear advantage that whole blood is more concentrated than components. And this goes to something that uh, this is a pet peeve for me. When I hear people talk about the the one to one to one as as being uh, as quote unquote replicating whole blood, it, it makes me want to scream because clearly, in my view, it's not the same. So I w- I will open up the soapbox and and allow you to 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 have that discussion. Well, you're you're right, Joe. Um, it's it's not quite the same. You know, when you think of it, we collect the whole blood into. 63 mils of uh, CPD solution, mm-hmm. and then if it's if it's going to be an additive red cell, we add 100 mLs of additive solution to each red cell, and so by the time you've gotten five, six red cells, you've gotten half a liter of fluid that doesn't transport oxygen, that doesn't get blood to clot, mm-hmm. it doesn't it doesn't do anything other than keep the red cells in a liquid, uh, neutrified state. Mm-hmm. So that's basically useless fluid, yeah. right? You know, we we know that saline is not a good thing to be using uh, in big quantities during a, a, a trauma resuscitation. You know, the, the surgeons want stuff to be yellow, right? Yellow, mm-hmm. gold. That's mm-hmm. what they want. If it's clear, they don't want too much of that going in. And so, right. um, you know, by the time a patient has had even, let's say, a massive, a, a traditionally defined massive transfusion of 10 units of, uh, of, of, uh, of red cells, that's, that's a liter right there of useless mm-hmm. fluid mm-hmm. That, 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 that didn't need to be transfused in the first place, right? Because it's, it's not helping the patient it's helping the red cells right. so the more the more that we the more that we reconstitute whole blood that is putting a red cell a platelet and a plasma back together again um, the more that we're adding or we're compounding the problem of the additive solution and the saline that's in all of these products mm-hmm. that doesn't benefit the patient so it's true that you do get an equivalent of a red cell plasma or platelet if you reconstitute it mm-hmm. but if you're using whole blood you only get a little bit of a dilution because we only have to use 63 or so milliliters of CPD to, to dilute it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So it's um, a more concentrated product. Comes in one bag. It's easy to transfuse. Okay. But I feel like a salesman. Uh, yeah. I'll just admit, I feel like a salesman. <laughs> like like I ought to be getting some royalties every time a unit of whole blood. But that's not what's happening. That's not. I I, well, we've got to work on that. Clearly, Mark. Um, <laughs> so and forgive me. I'm not trying to put you in that kind of a position. I, I just I, I think it's really important to hear this because so many people um, have not ever practiced in an environment where where whole blood is is even some it's even on the table necessarily. And realistically, I mean, I, I've you and I have both been doing this for a while, and uh, I can't say that there have been many places in my practice where, uh, outside of the military, where whole blood has been something that that has been considered. You, on the other hand, are, are in a different environment than I am, but I think a lot of people listening to this are going to be going, "Wait, whole blood? We can do that?" So it's I think it's really important for you to be the salesman, Mark. We need to hear about this. Well, then I'll say we can and we should be doing whole blood. You know, I'll tell you a quick story, Joe. Okay. Um, I was in uh, I was in London, England, and I wanted to uh, give a presentation at one of the the hospitals in London. And so I called up a friend and I said, you know, I'm going to be in town. Do you have a form for me to give um, give rounds? And uh, she said, Yeah, sure. You know, uh, absolutely. What would you like to talk about? I said, Well, you know, we've got this whole blood, and just just even as the last syllable of blood was coming out, she was like, Oh, no, 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 we don't want to hear that. <laughs> We're never going to have whole blood uh, in England. It's not. It's not on. Not, not next. Not move along. Uh-huh. Anyhow, I managed to persuade her to let me give the talk. And would you believe six months later they were calling me back to ask what how to implement whole blood in their helicopters? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I All felt right. I felt really good about that. Well, I, you should. I, I I like it. So so let's Mark. Let's move on and let's do uh, whole blood advantage number four. And it, the, I, I love this one because I, th- I think it's really important. It brings us to. It kind of brings in discussions that I've had elsewhere in into this topic, and it's super important. There is a belief out there, um, and and we in the blood bank have kind of fostered this. I think that that platelet when platelets get cold, by God, they don't work anymore. Uh, your premise, though, is that cold sword platelets might be great. What do you mean? Well, that's right, Joe. I mean, I, I remember, and it wasn't that long ago, telling residents, you know, if you put platelets in the refrigerator or the cooler, 
Um, you've just killed the platelets and you wasted them and, you know, the hospital's going to have to pay for that, blah, blah, blah. And, and while that is the way that uh, the standards are, are currently written, mm -hmm. there is ample, ample uh, in vitro, so experimental evidence that doesn't involve people, to demonstrate that uh, cold platelets are actually better than the traditional warm stored platelets. You know, so when the FDA was deciding how to store platelets, they looked at the recipients. Who's getting the platelets? And it turns out that the hematology oncology patients are the ones who are getting uh, the majority of the platelets. Mm -hmm. And so the decision was made to store platelets in a way that would provide the longest lasting hemostasis, which means to transfuse them uh, or to, to store them uh, at room temperature. Um, and so, so people derive this idea that cold platelets become, they change their shape, they become non-functional almost instantly. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, that's not true. Cold stored platelets um, change the sugars on their, on their uh, surface receptors and it exposes some new antigens, and those antigens are very attractive to the macrophages. So mm -hmm. when the cold platelets are circulating, they get plucked out um, very quickly in the matter of a couple of hours after the transfusion. Mm -hmm. But but, they, but these in vitro tests are showing that, that they're extremely functional, that in every in vitro test that we've done, they've performed better mm -hmm. than than uh, warm store platelets. Now, whether that translates into in vivo, mm -hmm. like in the person, um, better activity, that remains to be seen. But at least we have a very solid scientific background to try um, to, tr to try using cold store platelets uh, in patients who don't need five days worth of hemostasis, right. who just need five hours of hemostasis, like like the trauma patients. Yeah, I, I think that's an important point. It, it's, it's not necessarily looking at uh, whether you're talking cold stored platelets as a product or cold stored uh, as part of whole blood. We're not looking at something for, for long term, you know, keeping the platelet count up for long periods of time. We're looking for get, potentially getting something in there that's going to have an effect right now as opposed to down the line. That's right. I mean, the, these platelets, if they're, if they're cold stored in a matter of hours, the, the surface changes and they're going to be plucked out quickly, but mm -hmm. they don't go instantly. Mm -hmm. they, they circulate uh, and, and they can plug holes um, perhaps even better than, than, than warm store platelets. Okay. That remains to be seen. But, but like I say, uh, okay. in vitro, there's some evidence. And there were some, so there were actually a couple of studies um, looking at uh, bleeding times in patients who received warm store and cold store platelets. Mm -hmm. The cold platelets did better. Uh, and there was a study of patients who were um, cardi uh, cardiac surgery patients who were getting um, their their pump primed with ho with cold start platelets, and there was, there appeared to be uh, some benefit to them as well in those in that population. So, like I say, we have a very solid basis for thinking that these cold start platelets could be excellent for um, for for trauma patients. Wouldn't use it in the in the hematology patients, but certainly right. in in trauma. And so I, I think it's important for those of you that are listening um, and those of you that are, are on the clinical side, before you go calling your blood bank for, uh, for, you know, refrigerated platelets or before you just start on your own deciding to throw them into a cooler, the standards still do suggest that the, the, the storage needs to be 20 to 24. There are, there are places that have gotten variances, but that's just for study and it's just for immediate, immediate in resuscitation. Is that, am I summarizing that correct, Mark? That's right. Uh, the, the variant says you can use uh, an apheresis platelet for up to three days unagitated in the fridge. Right. But you can only use it for massive bleeding patients. You can't use it for anyone else. Got it. And and each and if th that variant is not just everybody can do it now, people have to apply for that variance, correct? Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. Um, the, the variance applies only for those who, who, who want it, who've applied for it. Okay. But again, you know, if, if they're making an exception, then that suggests that there's leeway in, in the way the standards could be written in the future to allow us to do this. Got it. One last question on that, and I, I think this is, uh, again, important for learners who are who are used to the concept of to keep platelet function, we, we need to have those platelets on, on an agitator. We have, to, we have to rock them. We have to rotate them. Is there, is there anything that uh, either in vitro data or otherwise on whether or not it's necessary to, to rock the whole blood? You know, it's interesting you say that because we had that thought, too. When we're storing our whole blood, we thought, you know, we're, we're, we're using the whole blood in part because of these platelets. We think mm -hmm. they could be really functional. Um, normally, we would rock the platelets, should we rock the whole blood. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we did that, and we showed that between day four and day 10, 
there's no difference in platelet function when you analyze it with the thromboelastogram between the unrocked, that is the, the whole blood that just sits there, mm -hmm. and blood that's rocked, whole blood that's rocked in three different ways. And so um, it did not increase the hemolysis, um, which was good. So if you want to rock your whole blood, you can do that. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to because it didn't change the, the thromboelastogram finding. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, and anyway, let's face it, uh, refrigerators with a three-prong plug on the inside are su so you can put an, uh, an agitator in are yeah. super expensive. So yes. this was very welcome news to everybody except people who make refrigerators. <laughs> yeah, they're not happy, but everybody else is, is good with that. Okay. All right. So uh, we, we've got to get to this one. And this is this is number five, uh, Mark. And, and it's, it is kind of the the elephant in the room in many ways where where people are are concerned about giving group o as universal quote unquote uh resuscitation for with whole blood because of the concern about hemolysis so your your contention is that and i'm quoting you nobody hemolyzes uh, what how can you support that mark what can you say about <laughs> that well 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 <laughs> so <laughs> we changed our practice in pittsburgh uh two and a half years ago to, to use whole blood as the primary resuscitation fluid in trauma patients. Mm -hmm. And part of that change of practice was that the clinicians would have to draw biochemical markers of hemolysis, LDH, bilirubin, haptoglobin, um, on the day the patient gets the whole blood, and then every day for two days afterwards. Mm -hmm. And what we, were, what we wanted to do was we wanted to look at the group O recipients who were not going to hemolyze from the group O blood right. versus everyone else. So the mm -hmm. A, B, and AB recipients who had the potential for hemolysis because group O whole blood has anti-A and anti-B in it. And so when we looked at the differences in these biochemical markers of hemolysis, we found no difference mm -hmm. between the O recipients and everybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that all the values were always in the normal range. You know, we measure LDH, but we don't specify is this the LDH from red cells or from tissue. And so you can imagine in a trauma patient, LDH is going to be through the roof. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't through the chimney in the non-O recipients. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it wasn't higher in the non-O recipients. Right. In fact, it was statistically identical. And, and we've expanded this. Uh, well, we've done this in, in our 200 patients who we've treated with whole blood. Mm -hmm. And we're not seeing any differences, any any marked differences. You know, are there small episodes of hemolysis that could be happening that aren't causing any clinical harm? Possibly. But it's nothing that we're detecting yeah. Um, with our tests. And, and I can tell you as, as kind of a sidebar, you've taken some sidebars, Joe. I'm taking a sidebar okay, now. Okay, bring it on. Uh, with, with Nancy Dunbar and the BEST Collaborative, we mm -hmm. did the STAT study mm -hmm. where we retrospectively looked at, again, trauma patients who were getting group A plasma. You know, because no one has enough AB plasma anymore. And so right. we're starting to use group A plasma for, for like in place of AB for, for trauma patients. And mm -hmm. so with Nancy, we looked at, at group A recipients of A plasma, so identical, and then B and AB um, recipients who were getting plasma that was not compatible. And we looked at early mortality, uh, hospital mortality, length of stay, and we found, again, no significant difference, not even close right. um, in, in the patients who got the compatible plasma versus the incompatible plasma. And so that's a very similar uh, parallel to our whole blood um, because the, the, the B and AB patients in the STAT study were getting four units, of, got a, an average of four units of, of, of A plasma, and we're in Pittsburgh now using four units of whole blood, which is about the same amount mm -hmm. of, um, of, of antibody. And in the STAT study, I think it was 72% of the participants did not titer the anti-B right. in their plasma. Right. So, you know, if, there, if ever there was going to be a bad outcome, mm -hmm. um, it, it would have been here, and, and, and we didn't see it. Yeah. So that tells us that our, our, our low titer whole blood is is very safe. Well, your your sidebar worked right into my marketing strategy, considering that I had I had Nancy and uh, Tate Stevens, who who was lead author on a similar article published uh, in uh, early August of 2017, talking about talking about stat and talking about uh, Tate's study as well with with Group A. So bbguy.org slash zero three six. You you've you just worked right right into there mark that was fantastic <laughs> check but, is in the mail yes all right so if you if you would before we get off of this topic um one more time could you just could you summarize the characteristics of the the product that that you're using for for your adult trauma patients uh in pittsburgh um in, including blood type how you're modifying it what what the criteria you are uh, using to look at it Super question, Joe. So for the adults, we use group O 
uh, Rh positive male donors, and we use male donors uh, to mitigate the risk of trolley um, mm-hmm. because that's a low risk product if it comes from a male because we can't get pregnant. Mm-hmm. Um, and we use Rh positive be- because we we've selected to use uh, this product only in male trauma patients and in female trauma patients who we can identify are over age 50. Okay. And that constitutes the vast majority of our trauma patients. Mm-hmm. We would be expiring a lot of O negative whole blood sure. if we if we included younger women. So it's O, it's Rh positive, it's male donor. We use the uh, an inline leuco reduction filter that spares the platelets, and so mm-hmm. the product is leuco reduced as well. Um, we keep it um, for 14 days as whole blood, and on day 15 we take it back if we haven't used it, and we spin off the red cell and we transfuse it as an O positive red mm-hmm. cell. So it's very uh, it, it helps us to recover a bit of the cost, and we, and we waste almost none of these units because yeah. they're O positive. Really, anybody can get those. And we use a low titer, less than 50, for both anti-A and anti-B. Right. And for the reference lab uh, people, that's an immediate spin uh, titer with no enhancements, mm-hmm. um, and, and it's just done in saline. Um, there's a little bit of a difference for the pediatric uh, patients uh, who get our whole blood. We use O-negative red cells mm. because there's not a lot of pediatric trauma. Yeah. And uh, we want to be able to include the the, uh, the girls, and so we use O negative um, whole blood, but we use the same titer of less than fifty, and all okay. the other characteristics are the same. Got it. Uh, one question about the titers, uh, Mark. Do you consider uh, people once titered always titered, or do you have to do it every time? You know, another good question, Joe. So we actually have some data from from my colleagues in Denmark. We looked mm-hmm. at fifty six blood donors and lab volunteers. And what was cool about this study was that from these 56 people, we we did a titer on them, an ABO titer, um, quarterly. So we did four titers on them mm-hmm. over the course of a year. And they could live their life, right? They could get vaccines. They could have babies. They could do whatever they wanted. They just had to come and have their titer taken every four, every three months. Uh-huh. And we showed there was no difference, really? right? There was at most like a one titer difference between um, between the different uh, titer levels that we did, so that data would support um, not not having to titer um, every donor every time. But in mm-hmm. Pittsburgh, uh, we do titer every donation every time, um, mm-hmm. and we make sure that they're always um, always low titer, less than fifty. I'm I'm and, guessing that's the, the, you're going to include include that data in a in a report at some point to see whether those donors change. I uh, I wish we could. Ah. Um, that there's some technical issues about why Got we it. can't quite do that, but that would be great. However, to make up for that, again, Nancy Dunbar um, <laughs> has another study going with Best, where called the Tipsy study, uh, where we're looking at um, how many um, how many units of platelets, plasma, or whole blood failed whatever the threshold was and we're looking to see is there a variation over the course of a year so Mm -hmm. we're going to be um we're we're going to be analyzing failures by time of year to see if there's any you know seasonal variation like if after the flu shot everyone's abo titer goes up or not um Mm -hmm. and i can tell you having having done almost two years of looking at my whole blood there doesn't appear to be any sort of periodicity of of changing but that's at a sort of a broad population level Okay. We we want to make sure that every unit is a little tighter. So we need to get to your to your last advantage, and this is I think this is really really important because people are gonna people are of course gonna ask this question, and we've we've danced around it a little bit, but now I'm gonna now I'm gonna pin you to the wall, Mark. What do we know about outcomes? How do how, what have you studied so far? What has been studied so far that can give us an idea of whether whole blood um, does better, worse, or the same? You know, so far what we're getting is that patients don't do worse when they get the whole blood. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we published um, uh, about a dozen different outcome parameters uh, between our uh, control group of male patients who had at least one red cell, uncrossed matched red cell in mm-hmm. trauma, compared to about 50 whole blood patients. And we showed there was no significant difference in any of the uh, length of stay or, or mortality um, uh, parameters. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we showed the same thing in our 18 um uh, pediatric patients who were treated with whole blood compared to a, a historical cohort, there was no difference in, in any of the um, of the outcomes. And, and frankly, that, that's what we would expect because yeah. we're giving a fairly low dose of whole blood, right? Mm-hmm. We're giving now four units of whole blood, which really, if you think about it, is the equivalent 
of one adult dose of plasma uh, of platelets. Mm -hmm. That's it's, it's it's one dose. So back in the day when we were giving one and two units of whole blood, you wouldn't really expect to see much of a difference in 24-hour blood product use or in hemostasis mm -hmm. because we weren't giving a lot of platelets. Now we're giving four units. I have a feeling we'll we'll, we'll be moving up to to six units. Um, shortly because that's what our surgeons want and i think that's still a reasonable amount to give before we start giving personalized uh, approach to 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 the resuscitation so now i think when we're giving larger quantities we're going to be able to see if these cold platelets are really hot stuff <laughs> yeah <laughs> and we're going to see if it's uh you if, couldn't resist uh, could you you could no, not I help couldn't. it <laughs> i could not i was waiting all 45 minutes to get to that <laughs> and that's so, fantastic you know, we're, we're, we're going to see. I think now is the time. I think we've shown the safety, which is what we were trying to do initially with the one and two mm -hmm. units, was show, you know, can we do it? Yes, we can. Are they going to hemolyze? No, they're not. Now it's the time where we're going to be able to say, well, are we making uh, – is there any efficacy uh, change here? And I think now we're going to we're gonna be able to see that. And, mm -hmm. and, and like I say, in our, in our, even in our pediatric population, um, where we give it, by the way, to kids who are over three years old and more than 15 kilo, so that their mm -hmm. ABO expression is a little bit more advanced and so they can absorb any of the incompatible antibody, we're not seeing any hemolysis. And their outcomes, length of stay, ventilator, days, that kind of thing, was, was not significantly different. But okay. again, we don't have a lot of um, uh, uh, that's that we don't have a lot more evidence. Um, mm -hmm. Frankly, when, when we saw the results of the STAT study, we were overjoyed. Yeah. Because it, it once again confirmed the safety of the product, but now we need to show efficacy. And to, and, and and frankly, I'll tell you this: here comes the salesman uh, again. <laughs> okay, is that even if patients don't do better, mm -hmm. even if the whole blood patients just do as well as the others, if we're making the surgeons' lives easier and the the air uh, ambulance and the helicopter people's uh, lives easier by by simplifying their their logistics, mm -hmm. that's a win. You know that that's worth something to be right. able to. To make their lives easier, and, and if whole blood does that, then then I think that that justifies using it. Okay, Mark. So I, I think that I think that it's important for for people listening to understand that um, in in your circumstance uh, in Pittsburgh, you guys have a, a, a wonderful setup for for doing this. You're you're the blood center. You're the transfusion service in in a lot of the hospitals that you serve. In other cases, there may be some more logistics that might be involved. And, and it may not be just as simple as a surgeon calling the blood bank and saying, give me, give me some whole blood. There's some steps that might, ha might have to be taken. So can you just kind of give us a, a general idea of things that places that want to consider this might have to think of? You know, I think the, the, the main limitation will be the supply of the whole blood. Um, mm -hmm. If the blood center doesn't provide whole blood, don't forget, they collect whole blood. So right. it's not like the blood center doesn't have it. They mm -hmm. just turn it into components. Right. Um, I, I think I think it's going to be a matter of convincing the blood center um, uh, of, of the advantages of using whole blood and and, and of, of being able to um, create a business model for why they should start selling it to to your hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's that's going to be the, the main limiting step is um, is getting the blood center to to see the benefits of it and to uh, to have a stable and adequate supply of it to keep your program going. Right. Okay. Yeah. And speaking, speaking as someone who currently uh, is medical directing a blood center, I, I think that's correct. I mean, that it, it's not, you, it, you said it, it's not like we don't make whole blood. We have whole blood. We have whole blood all over the place. It's just that it usually goes on to something else, primarily because of what's been uh, the way transfusion medicine has been practiced in the United States since the 60s and 70s. The component therapy has been considered the, the standard of care. Let's break the product down and give the patient just what they need. But that, I think what, you, what you've what you made a case for today is that there are certain situations where that is not necessarily the best answer and there are easy, easier ways to do it. And so, you know, again, I think that's, I think it's important to understand that there, there are logistical things that have to happen, but it's not, they're not insurmountable logistical things. No, by no means. You know, performing an antibody titer is a straightforward thing. Uh, the blood center would have to develop a policy for doing it and, mm -hmm. and train people. But none of this is insurmountable. And, and, and I think when and if we show that that this really does uh, benefit our, our trauma patients, the blood centers will, will have to do it because it'll become um, it'll become the de facto standard of care at that point. Yeah. Uh, and, and, the, and, and they'll just have to make the policies and, and do it until then. Um it, it'll require some some 
delicate conversations with blood centers that are more reluctant to yeah. uh, get involved in selling it. Got it. Got it. Well, Mark, I, I look forward to the to the data that I, I know you will be involved in collecting and, and seeing uh, seeing further evidence going forward. I think you've made a great case for, for places to, to consider the use of whole blood. Anything you want to leave us with before we go? You know, I think that the, the, the other things that, 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 that a transfusion service um, starting up a whole blood program would want to consider would be just just a very basic things like um, how long are you going to keep the whole blood in the liquid uh, – like as whole blood, are you going to allow it to be used for all 21 days? Do you think the platelets are functional up to 21 days? How many units? Uh, um, well, is there going to be a maximum number of units that you'll mm-hmm. allow um, the, the, the surgeons to give to their patients? What patients are you going to let this be used in? Anyone who's having a massive bleed, are you going to include it in your massive transfusion protocol for trauma, for GI bleeding, for obstetrics, for right. anybody? You know, um, we just use it for trauma mm-hmm. uh, at the moment, limit of, of four units for now. Um, you know, and, 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 and other logistical questions like where are you going to put it? Are you going to put the whole blood in the emergency room refrigerator like we do? We have four units. Or are you going to keep it in the blood bank and the surgeons will have to order it and you'll right. have to figure out how to get it down to the to the ER or to the OR quickly? So I think there's a lot of stuff to think about. But as you said before, none of this is insurmountable. It, it just takes a plan. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Mark, my friend, this has been a blast. Uh, it, I, I, I'm sorry that you're, you know, you're going to have to bump up your protection after being on the podcast again but you know that's that's life buddy i'll get two sticks simple as that (laughs) (laughs) thanks so much mark cheers joe Hey guys, it's Joe with just a couple of closing thoughts. Uh, I love talking to Mark. He's he's a blast, and I, I love his take on things. He, I did promise at the beginning that we have an update on what we talked about. Um, we had kind of danced around the fact that Standard 5.15.1 in the thir- current 30th edition of ABB standards requires whole blood to be administered as as an ABO identical product and Mark had mentioned that that they were looking to try and see if that could be adjusted and as it turns out the 31st edition of standards that will be published online in January 2018 and will become effective in April of 2018 has changed all that the the way the new standard reads is that recipients shall receive ABO group compatible red cell components, ABO group specific whole blood or low titer group O whole blood for non-group O or for recipients whose ABO group is unknown. It basically allows low titer group O whole blood to be administered in the same way that group O uncrossed matched red cells are administered. People have to develop their own local policies for how you define low titer, how many units people can get and all that. But that, that's important and all that is very important. But what this allows is a potential change to the way Mark is describing things. Now, the reality is as a blood supplier, I will tell you uh, that most blood suppliers are not really thinking about supplying whole blood. So it will require some conversations with your blood supplier. It's not like we don't make whole blood. Uh, We collect whole blood all the time. It's just that whole blood is generally processed. And so the individual collection centers will have to make decisions on how exactly to do this should uh, trauma centers in particular want to move down this pathway. But it's exciting. It, it's some interesting information, and it's something I present for your benefit. So just a reminder, go to bbguy.org slash 040. You get a transcript of this episode and the link to get either PACE contact hours or continuing medical education credits. Again, that is completely free, up to one hour per month. My thanks to Mark Yazer for appearing on the podcast. Thanks to each of you for listening and for your feedback. Uh, I as I've said before, please interact with me through the comment page on bbguy.org slash 040. I will absolutely see every one of the comments that are made, um, and I interact quite often with people in that way. You can also find me on Facebook and on Twitter at, uh, at Blood Bank Guy. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to interact with you that way as well. So that is all for today. Thank you again. And as we close, I want to remind you one more time that I hope that as you go through your day that you'll smile. And have fun, and above all, never ever stop learning. Thanks a lot. We'll catch you next time on the podcast.